morning, everybody. It, oh, we're recording now. I don't know why your comments didn't get recorded and mine do, but uh, fair, fair enough. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I am too old to be part of the next gen. It's one of my pet peeves. When I was in my mid thirties, the US next gen group said, we're gonna make it 30 and younger. And then as I got to my late thirties, they said, all right, now we're gonna extend it up to 35. And then once I got into my forties, I think it got pushed higher. So unfortunately, I just seem to be a little bit too old. It's probably a good thing I'm, I'm a little bit of an old soul. So uh, I, I probably don't deserve to be with you guys on a regular basis, but it's great to be here today. I indeed am going to try to uh, provide, oh, Let's see, I don't know if that shared correctly. Let me get my right screen. So I am going to try to go through uh, S&D uh, presentation. Can you let me know if you're seeing that? It's being shared? Yes, we All do. Right. Great, thank you very much. So uh, I'll, I'll go through kind of an s and I do have some pet peeves about uh, research in general and sometimes news. And I just wanna share that with you, I'll feel better. So you, you might be my personal psychiatrist. I did just get back from a trip in Brazil on Friday. So I'm also going to let you in on a little secret that I did have to kind of wing this and put the slides together yesterday. So uh, if you see any typos or anything that seems out of order, please forgive me. Uh, in advance for that. So who am I? Uh, quick uh, introduction. I was originally uh, born in Kansas City, uh, American, as you can probably tell from my accent. I went to school in Texas and had studied finance, thought I wanted to be an investment banker. Uh, but while on campus interview, I saw a little brochure that said become a small business development volunteer with the Peace Corps, which is a service organization uh, that the United States government finances. Uh, three months later, I found myself in Bolivia, where I lived for two years, uh, working with a cooperative that was working to do uh, arts and crafts. And from there, I moved to Argentina uh, to work for an energy startup company before returning to the States and starting my coffee career. Uh, I've spent about 20, 21 years now in coffee uh, across multiple different companies listed there. The latest being, of course, Sucafina, where I've been since 2015. And I am also the, the founder of uh, the company that you know, mentioned earlier, Farmer Connect, that, that's doing end-to-end -end traceability. Uh, Hobby-wise, uh, street art is one of my passions. I won't tell you whether I'm spraying or collecting. Uh, I am a proud father and I'm a music uh, fanatic. And again, I won't tell you if I'm playing or just listening. Uh, so moving on, uh, overview. Well, what's our situation here in the world of coffee? Um, I think we went through 2020 and a lot of us were really happy to get to December 31st, 2020, celebrate the new year and say, whew, finally that year is behind us. Now, now we get to move on to 2021. Surely things can't get worse, right? Um, wrong. You know, it, it's been, uh, 2021 has definitely been the most complex year that I've ever had uh, in my career. Uh, it obviously started out with uh, drier than normal weather that, that happened in Brazil at the beginning part of the year. As a result of that, uh, starting already back in November of last year, I should say, and, and carried on into this year. As a result of that, we saw that the Brazil 21-22 crop would be uh, lower than what most of us had originally expected. After that, we had multiple frost events, which uh, the second one being the most meaningful one, uh, that caused damage. And, and now the market's holding its breath, waiting for rains in Brazil. So as much as there's a lot of other interesting things that are happening in other origins that are moving the, the balance sheet, and there's a lot of interesting stuff on the demand side, it really is all about Brazil. Um, but it's not just Brazil, uh, because as we all know, and we live every day, freight rates have gone parabolic. And that shifted a lot of different trade flows. It shifted what coffee becomes available, how it becomes available, uh, logistics, container availability is very difficult. Uh, so what's been the impact on the market? We, we've had future markets that have rallied in a significant way. And, and in the case of London, we've had forward spreads that have inverted. Uh, we've had differentials between uh, Brazil naturals and wash miles remain stubbornly quite wide, even though we all agree that the shortage should be in the, the Brazil natural. Um, a wide arbitrage between London and New York, which should be encouraging more demand to shift in, into Robusta, but 
you know, how, how is the demand dynamic of COVID playing out into that? And again, when we think of demand, oftentimes we think about, oh, it must be Europe because, you know, we're the big market. Then you have the, you know, United States that does okay. And, and then Asia from there, but we can't forget how meaningful of a player Brazil local demand is uh, being over 20 million bags. We've also had lots of stories. Originally it was the weak US dollar, you know, the, the Fed in the US is gonna print money and we're gonna have this really weak dollar. There's this commodity super cycle, which is coming. Uh, both of those have kind of dissipated. Maybe the weak US dollar story is starting to come back in, in vogue again, but the, those had dissipated. And then questions on inflation and what does that mean for, for commodities on a whole? And we have to understand that we no longer live in a bubble of just coffee itself, but these other macro factors really are oftentimes pulling us up and down accordingly. And then, of course, the demand, which I mentioned because of COVID, uh, we might have thought we were past COVID, we were past the lockdowns, and we could now go back to more stable demand figures, but new lockdowns in Asia maybe are throwing that into, into question. So let, let's start out with Brazil, the beginning point, November, uh, the dryness that, that we were seeing uh, there. So the, the dry season started, uh, you know, around that October, November period, you can just see weather station data here. You can see that the, on the top chart, the 109 November, it, it's below the historical average. We then got a lot of rain in December, more rain in South Venus than we did in Moisiana, which are two of the key regions uh, in Brazil. But then from there, it, it kind of tapered off and went back to the lower end of trend. And that all caused uh, the, the tree response for the 21-22 crop to, to not perform as well as we would have hoped. The, the cherry development and, and everything else just wasn't uh, quite as strong as what it should have been. And there's probably some lingering impact even into the 22-23 crop in terms of vegetative growth and, and no development that, that wasn't quite normal. Uh, having said that, you know, I understood that because 2122 was more impacted and more farmers did pruning than normal, maybe 2223 they do less pruning and maybe some of that offsets some of that vegetative growth, uh, but that really uh, remains to be seen. So moving on to the next event was the frost, you know, and, and I think there's nobody on this call who's unaware that, that there was a frost in Brazil or that it was meaningful, but what, what exactly happened? Why did we have this event? And it was the, the biggest event since 1994. Uh, so going back quite a long ways, I guess not many people on this call, including myself, were in coffee in 1994. So it's kind of new ground. And for those of you who are new in your coffee career, I would say you know, it's not a good thing. We don't celebrate farmers and, and having frost and damage, but congratulations to those of you who are living this because you're gaining very useful experience that even somebody like myself who has over 20 years in the business had never seen before uh, to this degree. So how did this happen? Uh, we need to understand that first it was a polar air mass that dislodged kind of from the South Pole and and due to atmospheric blocking. And some of these terms, they, they may not mean much to you, but I'll, I'll try to go through them pretty quick. From there, we had a high pressure that, that pushed up through Argentina and extended into the center south of Brazil. And what that high pressure does, you know, sometimes you read in these reports, it's a 1030 bar pressure or 1025. And what does that mean? The higher the pressure, it means the more clear skies you have and calm winds. And, and that's really perfect condition for radiation cooling to spread over the area. Um, from there, it was also accompanied um, the, with, with the polar air that allowed the dew points to, to really go below zero. And, and so that's another factor that, that leads into it. And then lastly, because it'd been so dry uh, due to the, the former months of not getting a lot of rain, that left the soil conditions perfect for, for frost to permeate. So it was really kind of this triple whammy of perfect conditions that, that allowed the frost to come in. So what was the impact? Now, here's where Guillaume was talking about at the beginning where I just wanna warn you, you know, we, we all see reports and some of the reports are good and some of the reports frankly are quite bad. So if I wanna show you one slide, Here's the devastation story. Let me tell you, there's no coffee in Brazil. This is a disaster. You will not be able to buy Brazils, you know, and, and people try to hype it and, and cause you to have lots of fear. And there's lots of scary pictures. I mean, 
These are all my own pictures. These are not pictures I've taken from anywhere else. I took these last week. There's pictures of dead baby trees. There's pictures of trees that aren't going to produce for the next two years. The top right, there was fires uh, in a coffee field. Now, I think there was one coffee field that was on fire, but there's coffee fields on fire. You know, there's all these stories that are permeating. And sometimes it can cause us not to maybe think clearly and, and get the, the fear factor in. On the flip side of it, you have other people who are saying, oh, it was fine. There was no problem. What do you mean frost? You know, all right, maybe there's marginal areas of frost, but look at this. Again, these are all pictures I took within the last week. So you can really sell depending upon what story you want to be hyping or, or what side of the coin you want to be on. You can really sell the, the story. And what's the reality? Because I, I guess you guys want to know what the reality is. I'm going I'm to share two slides. One is that the reality is in the middle. You know, was it a disaster scenario that we can't come back from? No, it was not. Was it a non-event that's not going to impact the, the supply and demand of coffee? No, it wasn't. There, there is that middle ground where there was an impact. And what makes it very difficult is that you have parts of the country and parts, when I talk about the country, Brazil's a big country and you have to go into regions. And when you go from regions, you have to go into micro regions. And even within those micro regions, you see different parts that were impacted versus not impacted by the frost, depending upon sometimes the elevation, sometimes the, the exact location of it, how the wind blew through the farm. And so what we end up is kind of the light frost scenario, the moderate frost scenario, and the severe frost scenario. And just to show you how difficult it is, I have a quick video uh, that I want to share with you guys. Just to, you can ignore the, the audio, but here we're seeing, you can see the tree looks fine, right? Not, not a lot of damage there from, from the frost. And what I'm doing is I'm just walking down a hill. So we're starting at the top part of the hill and I'm just slowly walking down the hill and just wait for it. You'll see what's at the bottom of the hill. So you're starting to see it, right? There's the frost damage that's happening. There's the trees that, that are going to need to either get uh, cut or they're going to need to get replaced. They're further down. There's even more damage. So when, when we're talking about these frost events, it's very difficult to measure. And I just want to say from the outset that I know a lot of us have team members who have been in Brazil. They've been making crop estimates. And I don't want to make fun of anybody's number because it's hard to make an estimate. It really is. And, and I have a lot of respect for the people who have to do that job, but we need to recognize that there were kind of two main types of frost that came. One is a regional where it was just cold and everything in that kind of micro region uh, had frost that impacted it. Not always the whole tree. Sometimes it's the top 20, 30% of the tree, but the bottom 67% is alive. Sometimes it's 10, 90, sometimes it's 50, 50. I mean, it's, it's varied. But then the other one is exactly that video that I just showed you, where you're kind of going down a hill and the top of the hill is fine. But as you go to the lower and lower areas, you ended up having more frost. And that's actually probably more a high risk area. So those high risk areas, you know, probably they didn't have coffee five, 10 years ago. But when prices were good, farmers probably just kind of extended into the higher risk zone saying we haven't had a frost in 15 years. We haven't had a frost in 17 years now. We haven't had a frost in 20 years and just kept encroaching into those higher risk areas. And, and those are some of the areas uh, that got hit. So, you know, whoop, we don't want to watch that video again. So here we go. First thing, top five red flags when discussing Brazil crop numbers with somebody. Don't trust them if they miss the 2014 Arabica crop estimate by more than 20%. So some of you might remember 2014. Yeah, we had the, the dryness that came in January and February. There were all kinds of crop estimate figures that, that came out. And you know there, there were crazy estimates all over the place. And I think track record matters. If local teams miss the crop by 40% in 2014, I don't know that you want to put the most weight in those people today. So track records do matter. Number two, don't believe them if they tell you what their crop figure is, but not what their local consumption figure is. Now, this has nothing to do with frost. This is just Brazil in general. If somebody says, oh, Brazil produces 70 million bags, 
it matters whether their consumption figure in Brazil is 20 million bags or 23 million bags, right? If you have a higher internal consumption, you can have the higher production number and still export the same amount of coffee. But when we talk about crop numbers, whenever I go to conferences, people are like, what's your number? And, and I just think that, you know, what your number is a little bit deceptive and, and probably not fully honest. Don't trust anyone who can tell you after a week of being boots on the ground what the size of the crop is. I went for two weeks and I have no clue how to judge what the size of the next Brazil crop is. We have agronomists who are professionals who spend their whole month every year, you know, going around doing crop tours, visiting these neighborhoods. Some of them were born and raised in these local regions that grow coffee. Their parents are coffee farmers. There is no way that I can show up from Switzerland in Brazil and a week or two weeks later have a clue what the crop is. Number two, don't trust anyone who does crop tours from an airplane. And I think that was really dominant during the frost. I think some of the people with the higher damage numbers of frost you know, rented airplanes and, and did flights. And, and on my journey, I was lucky enough to, to spend lots of time in a car, but we did have a few flights where we were able to circle some of the regions that got hit by frost. And from above, it definitely looks worse. Why is that? Because when frost hits 10 or 20% of the tree, it doesn't hit the bottom of the tree. It hits the top of the tree. So when you're seeing those aerial pictures from above, you see all the damage. But what you're not seeing is the green that's underneath those top leaves. So it can be deceptive as to how meaningful the frost is. Uh, number one, don't trust anybody who tries to tell you what the Brazil crop is who is not Brazilian or doesn't travel there regularly. So again, it, it's a very complex country. It's very big. There's lots of nuanced factors. You have to be traveling regularly to really understand it. And then one bonus, don't trust anyone's crop number who is Brazilian. And you're going, nah, that's not fair, right? So, all right, fine. But has an agenda or a subsidy to be given. So right now, we know the government's going to give 1 billion KIs, $200 million of relief aid to, to producers who were hurt by frost damage. So if you're a producer, is your incentive to overestimate your damage or underestimate your damage if you're going to get money? So obviously the numbers that get reported that sometimes get reported then by the government can be maybe slightly inflated due to subsidies and, and pushes for who's going to receive money. So that, that's some pet peeves and hopefully helps provide some guidance. So now let's go to the forward period. Uh, April, August uh, that we've just lived in uh, will end up in the top five of the driest periods over the last 30 years. Uh, we don't have any rains anticipated for the next 10 days, uh, no meaningful rains, maybe little trace amounts into South Minas and the Cerrado area. Uh, the Conilon area on the, on the coast has gotten rain, some rain's gotten into Zona de Mata, which is more known for the Rio Minas coffees, but kind of that, that North Sao Paulo producing area and up into South Minas, we haven't had a lot of rains. This I just pulled from Somar this morning. so. I'm not pushing a view here. I'm just showing what, what the chart's currently showing for the forward forecast, which is that it's dry. Um, some people have said, as of the 1st of September, that if we don't get rains, that the yields will start to decline. My personal view is that it never rains on the 1st of September. Usually we're getting rains in the second half of September or the first half of October. For me, that's just kind of normal at this point. Maybe it's not historically normal, but it's what I and my, my little head have mentally penciled in. So when I was looking at the crop, I was saying, you know what, if we don't get rain by September 15th, are we okay or not? And my general answer was, yeah, we're, we're probably okay. Um, if we go past September 15th, are we okay? You know, maybe you start to get a little bit of yield loss, but I would say once you get past end October, that's where the sensitivity, because we had such a dry April, August, there's probably a higher sensitivity to rains. But again, yield loss is impossible to know. I mean, you, you it, it doesn't, there's not a magic button where it's like, now everything's fine. Oh, no, now the yield is down. So it's really tough to, to say how much is that, how to quantify it. And I think we're only really going to know once we eventually get the flowering. And once we get the flowering, then the farmers are going to decide what do you do with a tree that has 20%, 30%, 40% frost damage and the rest is productive. Do you harvest it? 
do you do uh, what they call skeleton pruning, where you cut the branches and cut the top of it, and it doesn't produce next year, and then it produces after? Those are the type of decisions farmers are going to have to make. So I think it's very difficult right now to talk about a 22-23 crop number. I think we really have to get through that flowering event, and then there's three months of work that the agronomists in Brazil are going to have to do on seeing farmer behavior, seeing the flowering, seeing the fixation, and it's probably only in January that we'll really get a good handle on it, but I would say that Whereas I had been more relaxed, if the weather remains dry, I definitely get a little bit more nervous myself. So what does that mean for us? I am purposely not going to show you a 22-23 crop number for the exact reason I just said. It would not be fair. I would be pulling something out of my rear end and that's not fair to you guys. So what we can say is that the Arabica uh, crop cycle during 1920 and 2021 were very good. We can look at the historicals. We can see that there's an uptrend in place. And what I can tell you guys is that uh, Conalon is looking really good. We, we had a, a record Conalon production. Uh, the next year is going to be similar in size. It should be an off cycle, even though Conalon doesn't have as strong of a Arabica on off cycle, it should be somewhat of a setback, but because of the investments that are being made, because of the care that people are taking, because of the acreage that's expanding, and because the weather seems in general to be okay, you know, I, I am looking for a fairly strong uh, Conalon crop to come. And the Arabica, again, for 22, 23, it, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. So uh, last thing on Brazil, and then I'm going to move on uh, because I know we spent the first 20 minutes on Brazil and, and you probably want to see something other than Brazil. There, there's a dynamic that's going on and, and it's talked about in the news and I maybe not everybody understands it, so I just wanted to explain it, which is Brazil forward selling and what's the big deal? So why would a producer sell forward crops? And I've taken an example here, just very simple, and said, you know, let, let's look at the curve of New York. So let's say today's price a year ago, I'm not talking about today, but say a year ago was $1.20. And if you went one year in time, it was $1.30. And then maybe the curve kind of flattened out from there and it was $1.30, maybe it's a little bit higher. If you looked at the local currency, it was say the REI was at 520. But if you went one year for it, it'd be at 550. If you went two years for it, it might be at six. So the further out in time you went, the better the price was both for New York as well as the REI. So that provided an incentive for farmers to say, you know what, I don't really see how New York can rally. This, by taking advantage of this forward curve, I can receive a higher price for my coffee. So I'm going to sell part of my production on the forwards. So that has happened. Farmers have sold. And now there's really a question mark as to will farmers deliver? And you've seen lots of uh, articles, probably farmers, will they default? Will they not default? And yes, it's, it's a conversation that we need to have as an industry. It's a conversation that has to happen. But my take on it, having visited there, is that farmers understand that they have a forward obligation and they're going to deliver on that forward obligation. Farmers in Brazil, they treat their farms like a business, whereas in a lot of countries, farmers treat the farm like a livelihood. And it's very different when you're talking about that extra money being able to send kids to school or you know, make investments uh, to diversify crops or do something, or it's whether you're gonna buy another private plane to, to fly around the, the country or, or do a shopping trip in Miami. Not that all farmers in Brazil are rich, but uh, there, there is a little bit more wealth and it is a little bit more of a business and reputation matters. But why is it a big issue for, for the trade houses? On the trade house side, looking at the bottom part of this, let's look at the, the bottom two. So we buy the coffee and we sell a future at $1.20. The market goes up to $2, but we're only receiving the physical coffee in, in 2022. So we don't have the coffee. We can't sell that coffee because we don't own it yet. Or maybe we can sell it, but we can't receive the, the cash for it at the $2 price. In our margin account, in our futures account, we have 80 cents of loss sitting there. And that equates to about $30,000 that we've had to send for each lot that we've bought. So what that does is that means that trade houses are using lots of their own money to finance these margin calls for producers. Now, why do I talk about that? Because sometimes there's this idea that, you know, we're the evil middlemen, right? You know, we buy coffee cheap because we know there's going to be a frost. We know there's going to be drought. And then we wait for the price to go up and we sell it and we make a ton of money. But that's not the reality. That's not how the world works. In this reality, we're hedging the coffee. And as the market goes up, we're paying those margin calls. 
And then if we sell the coffee at $2, yes, we have a $30,000 gain on the physical, but that's offset by that $30,000 loss on the futures account. And that, that's really uh, just basic hedging. So when you hear about far, farmer forward sales, that's what's going on in Brazil. So let's move on. Uh, Brazil's great, but there is the rest of the world to cover. Um, we're going to do it a lot quicker than we did for Brazil. Colombia, um, you know, the, the issue Colombia has had has been just not getting the climate right. We've had multiple years um, where we've just had too much rain, and that tends to be the thing in Colombia. When you hear that it's raining below normal in Colombia, that's actually usually a good thing. When you hear it's raining more than normal in Colombia, that's when we start to be concerned. Uh, if I look at productive potential of Colombia, I see, you know, basis the, the area that they have, the crops that they have, you know, 14, 14 and a half million bags is very doable, but the crop just keeps coming in lower. And the same thing is happening now, where it's not only that you're getting too much rain, but you're getting too much clouds. So you're not getting enough sunlight into the trees so the trees don't get stressed enough. And then when you get the flowerings, you just kind of get these weaker flowerings. So, you know, the one positive news in Colombia is that the price is very good. You know, I think back to just 18 months ago and when we would have been talking, we would have been talking about how we need to come in with more price stabilization for farmers. We need to, to really crack down on those evil hedge funds that keep selling and shorting coffee. We need to do all these things. And now the market's at high levels and nobody cares about uh, speculators because speculators are buying the market, not selling it. So now it's okay. Um, you know, farmer income levels are phenomenal. Uh, but for me, and I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, the concern I have is that we all know the boom and bust cycle of coffee. And so, you know, for me, I'm really hoping that, that our Colombian friends and producers around the world can really take advantage of some of these higher prices, pay off debts, and, and then really think hard about, do they want to expand acreage or do they want to reinvest that money in another way? And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, other miles, I apologize for doing a massive grouping, but for the sake of time, I didn't have time to go through each individual country balance sheet. Um, you know, we've seen that the demand and for, for mild coffee has been on the decline, but that's also been accompanied by production as more and more demand has shifted into Brazil's and Vietnam's. I think uh, Hannah from Volcafe gave a presentation to you guys last year that kind of showed some long-term trends. So I decided not to replicate that. Uh, but, that. Part of, but part of that shift has uh, been coming from uh, that other mild category, just losing production. And obviously when you have coffee that sits at a dollar uh, and you have, uh, very low prices, there is an impact. At the same time, we know that both Honduras and Nicaragua had been impacted by hurricanes uh, for, the, for this last crop that, that was just harvested. And going forward, unfortunately, we've had irregular flowerings. Uh, we've had uh, COVID-related problems with, uh, with labor. We've had migrant labor go, moving to the U.S., uh, Roy has been popping up in, in a more meaningful way. And unfortunately, our view on 21, 22 is that we're not looking for a significant rebound. Um, I do believe that the higher price environment should lead to bigger crops going forward. But if you've taken off fertilizer, if you're not doing as much fertilizer and you go back to putting fertilizer, again, it's not a magic switch where you go back to full production. It takes multiple years to, to see that go up. So I am bullish. I don't think that that the milds are always going to be down and out. I think that there is going to be a role for them to play of greater importance going forward, origin diversification. I think we've all realized that we need that and, and that we need to be supporting these origins in order to have alternatives. Uh, when there's strikes that shut down you know, a country to not be able to export, or we have container issues, or we have the frost you know, or droughts, climate change that, that's coming, we need these origins to be thriving. So I'm very positive that the trend will start to go up from here if we look forward. Um, Ethiopia, you know, steady, steady, steady. You know, they had that banner year in 16, 17. They pulled back in 17, 18 as, as a result of bad weather. And now it's been four consecutive years where, where the production trend has been on the rise. And this is a country where, you know, we traditionally thought of it probably more as being a natural Arabica country producer from a balance sheet perspective, uh, maybe not from a, a roasting and trading perspective because they produce obviously amazing fully washed coffees, but we are starting to see a little bit more of a shift into investments in washing stations and definitely seeing more washed coffees coming into production here. 
Uh, moving on to Indonesia, uh, and this is Robusta and Arabica combined, you know, I'm not ripping them uh, by, by, by using the, the title here. It's really less a comment on production, which has been pretty stable between 10 and 11 million bags uh, in total, but it's more comment on their internal demand. Their internal market continues to grow, maybe this year because of uh, the bad outbreak of COVID, we see some setback from that. But in general, there, there has been this big increase in internal consumption, and that's eating into the local inventory and causing exports to, to kind of slide down. So whereas before we always had in, in our minds that they'd be a seven to 10 million bag exporter, at least that was my expectation at the beginning of, of say the 2010 decade, um, you know, today we're looking at them more being a 5 million bag exporter. So they're, they're sliding down. The good news is you, you have uh, countries that are stepping in uh, that also have increases in exports, increase in production. And Uganda is one of those. Again, this is uh, robust and Arabica combined. In this case, we reached 4.8 uh, million bags um, in 1920 on the Robusta alone. Um, we're really looking for the crop, uh, all right, 21, 22, maybe a slight pullback, but the trend is higher. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. The investments that are being made in the country, both in Arabica and Robusta, are paying yields. You know, a lot of us, uh, I know Sukafina is very involved in, in farmer outreach programs, and, and many of our peers, other trade houses are, are equally focused on the country because of the population, the number of farmers that you can reach, the number of lives that you can change, and Uganda is really astronomical. So uh, it also happens to be a very nice Robusta. So if you're thinking about an arbitrage you know, between New York and, and London being quite wide, and you're saying what coffee could get used, I mean, to me, it's a slam dunk no-brainer. You know, this, this is an origin of the future. Um, Vietnam, you know, as the uh, poet LL Cool J said, don't call it a comeback. You know, I've been here for years and I, I apologize to throw in that 90s reference that most of you probably don't recognize, uh, sadly, um, because it's a great song. But, uh, but uh, the reality is, is that Vietnam's productive uh, capacity, productive acreage has always been high. They've just had bad luck with weather as well. They, they've had less than ideal weather. Yes, there's been some pepper that's come in. There's been Dorian that's come in, alternative crops that are there, but the coffee's still there. And we really think that 21, 22 is a year where Vietnam is going to, you know, show the feathers a little bit more and, and produce a really solid crop, uh, which again, given the, the wide arbitrage, uh, should be attractive. Of course, freight being the, the wild card there. So having gone through um, the, the production side, let's shift for just a second into the, into the demand side. Um, I, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody. Uh, I have no clue what demand is. I'm not a roaster. You know, I'm a trade house. Uh, so we look at statistics and via statistics, we look at inventories, we look at exports and imports and everything else. And we come up with what we call disappearance. It's just what's the change in, in the stocks that we can see basis the amount of coffee that's come in and out. And we try to use that as a proxy for demand. And our view, 1819, we were, you know, rock and roll. You know, we, we were going full steam ahead uh, into 2020 and then COVID hit, you know, and obviously I don't need to tell you guys about the, the impact of lockdowns, the shifts out of home and home I think that's all been well talked about and there, there's plenty of other people who are more knowledgeable than myself on the topic, but we saw demand fall uh, for the first time in a long time. Uh, 2021, we believe was incrementally better. Uh, so we didn't have demand going lower, it, it did come back. But obviously you can see that the demand that was lost in 1920 was greater than the demand that was gained at 2021. So we're not quite back to that, that 18, 19 level of demand that we had hoped to be in. 21, 22, it's still a little bit early to say. I would have been optimistic if there wasn't this Delta variant. You know, we were getting kind of, most of the countries were kind of getting through COVID and it looked like things were opening up and vaccines were, were progressing and it kind of looked like there was light at the end of the tunnel. And of course, now we've had Delta come. Uh, we've had new lockdowns, uh, colleagues in, in Asia, Vietnam, you know, places that are, that are really uh, suffering and, and going through a hard time and our, our thoughts are with them. Uh, but it remains to be seen what impact that has on demand. So the jury's still out on 21-22 in, in view of what will come. So balance, uh, you know, on off cycle of Brazil tends to swing the balance sheet traditionally from surplus to deficit. The small year's a deficit, the on is a, is a surplus. And that was no different for, for 2021 and 21-22. 
Um, we know that some of our peers have bigger deficit figures for 21, 22 than ourselves. Some of that might be our, our Brazil numbers still being a, a little bit higher uh, than the market. Let's see, you know, yields in Brazil haven't been great. Uh, we need to, to get to the, the end of it to, to be able to say, you know, are there further adjustments coming or not? 22, 23, you know, it should be a surplus. Uh, that's a traditional on cycle of Brazil, but caveat being, what did I tell you about the Brazil 22-23 crop? We still don't know. We, we need to see the flowering. We need to see the farmer behavior. We need to see how much lower than normal that will be. Obviously, uh, due to the frost alone, I think most of the industry now is settling on a four to five million bag average. If I take all the averages that I've seen from the industry, that tends, seems like that's the middle. I'm a little bit below that myself. Um, but it's still a meaningful enough number that, that we have reduced the 22-23 uh, crop for sure. And if we don't get the rains on time and we do see further yield loss, it's only going to make that lower, which means that that surplus will continue to shrink, or could it possibly even turn into a deficit? Let, let's stay tuned. So now, next pet peeve that I want to get off my chest. I'm going to feel a lot better after this. So thank you for listening to me. You can send me a bill uh, afterwards. Five things to be wary of when you're reading news or analyst reports. And if you want a book, phenomenal book, trust me online, it, it talks about how the media gets manipulated to publish things that oftentimes aren't true. So it's a lot about fake news. Um, if an analyst that sells subscriptions really knew the future of the coffee market, they would trade it themselves and probably be on a super yacht right now in the Caribbean. Just food for thought. Um, some sites, some you know, news sites actually pay their reporters if their stories move markets. Now, the theory on that is, I know something really interesting and I'm gonna publish it and it's gonna, you know, the market's not gonna know that information and due to efficient market theorem, once the market knows it, then it's going to move the market up or down. But if you get paid to move markets, do you have an incentive to report the actual factual truth or maybe embellish the headline? How many times have you seen a headline that sounded super dramatic and then you read the article and you're like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. Just something to keep in sight. And I put a, a, a link uh, for backing that up because a lot of people don't believe me when I say that. Um, as revenue falls for media companies, many journalists are stretched and they're covering too many stories at the same time. You know, and I have friends who are journalists. I have a lot of respect for the industry. I'm not trying to rip them. But if you have to cover corn and soybeans and coffee and cocoa and, and all these markets at the same time, I mean, my head explodes with just coffee. I, I pity them that they have to cover all these stories. And it's tough to really have the, the knowledge and the skill set to be able to do it. Um, what is the credibility of the person being quoted in the article? You know, sometimes we see these quotes and I'm going to be honest with you. I've never heard of the people, never, never heard of the company. Um, but journals put more value on people who are quoted than people who are unquoted, so anonymous sources. So they tend to want those quoted people. If the person being quoted is someone you know, they're legitimate, they're solid, they're good, and, and many of us are, are quoted from time to time, awesome. But if it's a complete random and they're saying something that's really out in right field, dig into it before you just believe it. And then last, there's a desire to explain markets. So as the market's going up, nobody wants to give you bearish news because then they kind of look silly market's going up and you're saying it's bearish. Same thing as the market's going down about bullish news. So in general, as markets are going up, more bullish news will get ridden. As it's going down, more bearish news will get ridden. Obviously, big wild card here, freight train, blues. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, this has been a hard year. Uh, container availability is tough. On the bottom, I have the index, uh, just a random index of, of freight that shows, you know, we've gone kind of from 1,000, 1,500 to 10,000 on, on an index, rates have gone up. And I think we've all felt that and, and that's been a catalyst. I don't have the time to go into what the implications of that are, but it's safe to say that we're disrupting a lot of different trade flows, uh, traditional trade flows that existed because of freight, because of those discrepancies. And it means that coffee that's already sitting on the spot that got shipped before the freight rates went up actually probably has an intrinsic amount of value to it. So the space between um, arbitrage, you know, this is uh, the chart of London and New York. You can see that we're at pretty elevated levels. We got up to almost 130 cents of difference. And uh, across this uh, entire history that, that we see, that's only happened a few times. So again, this should be incentivizing some amount of shift out of Arabica's into Robusta, but 
it remains to be seen. You know, usually it's not a switch that happens immediately. Again, that magic switch that doesn't exist. You know, every roaster is going to react differently, uh, small, medium, large, the time, the blends, it's not an easy thing to do. It takes time. So sometimes we don't see that feed into our balance sheets till much later. You know, as a trader, we think, oh, it's gonna happen tomorrow. And it, it just takes more time. Uh, quick note on certified stocks. So uh, we're now at the point where, congratulations, we have a Brazil contract. Uh, Brazil semi-wash now are the majority component of the ICE certified stocks. I don't think anybody expected the certs to go up as much as they did. You know, I was originally saying, all right, maybe half a million bags, 700,000 bags come in. It ended up being over a million bags. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, ooh, that, that there's gonna be a lot of demand for those coffees. Thus far, we really haven't seen them moving down. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't going to demand, be demand going forward as the 21, 22 Brazil crop smaller. Maybe there's some replacement that comes in, maybe freight incentivize as people to use that, that coffee. But as of now, the stocks remain kind of at a, at a healthy level uh, above that 2 million bag. Uh, in the case of London, uh, we are starting to see those draws. You know, you can look at this bigger history picture and see it's not that dramatic as of yet. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are believing that the stocks will move much lower in a quicker order, and that's had an impact on London. One of the questions I got beforehand is, why are London spreads inverted? Now, I won't tell you what I think about London spreads, but they have inverted because there are enough market participants who believe that those certified stocks are going to continue to move lower. At the same time, there's been money flows that have been coming into the market and, and that's really caused those spreads to invert for the time being. And it remains to be seen if that is a trend that continues or not. Um, fund flows, the, this actually does matter. You know, it's something that we probably don't spend enough talking about. We always look at our little COT report, you know, our CIT report in New York or the London commitment of traders and you know, try to judge what, what's happening within the coffee space. But I think it's, it's helpful to take a big step back. I mentioned earlier the super commodity cycle story. There's this view that like super commodities, every commodity in the world is going to go up. Huge amount of inflows came in. It's a hedge against the weak dollar. It's a hedge against inflation. So you had these big inflows that came in and you know we, we almost peaked out at about 110, 115 uh, billion dollars. You can see that that numbers now move lower back, back down to 80. So you know we've had a significant exodus of money out of the general commodity complex. And this is just uh, CIT for those who are, are geeky and, and know what that means. Uh, the bottom one, uh, the, the blue line there, that's soft commodities. So there we're, we're talking about cotton, corn, uh, sugar, cocoa, uh, did I say coffee? So the, the, the soft commodities. So, and there you can see it's, it's actually the opposite of the trend. We've actually been continuing to see money flows coming into the soft commodities. So there's kind of been a, a rotation of money uh, that's been coming in uh, to softs and out of some of the other ags and, and protein categories. So, all right, here we go. Last rant, I promise then my rants are over and then I have a few more slides and then I'm gonna wrap it up and leave some time for, for questions that questions and answers, maybe answers, maybe I don't have the answer, but top five logic mistakes made in analysis and trading. So please memorize these, there will be a test later. Confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is when people have a view of the world and as soon as they see one story that confirms that bias, they grab onto it and they turn a blind eye to all the other stories or all the other points of logic that are against it. When you're reading analyst reports, is there confirmation bias in what they're telling you? Or are they giving you the whole lay of the land and giving you a very non-biased view of the world? Number two, belief in law of small numbers. How many times have you had somebody say, ooh, I saw a flowering that happened too early in Brazil. It's one flower. The country's a big country. You know, it, it's this belief that you can take a very small sample set and extract a big conclusion out of it. And oftentimes that gets written about by journalists because it's a sensational story. But because it's so small, it's irrelevant for the greater balance sheet. You know, because my cousin used to have a coffee shop in Topeka, Kansas that shut down, doesn't mean every coffee shop in the United States is shutting down. That's an example. Anchoring. So anchoring is a tendency to rely on readily available information. So I get the Somar report every day. I get a Drew Lerner report. So I, those are the reports I'm going to trust rather than asking myself, what actually causes 
rain to happen in Brazil. Let me understand those patterns. Let me dig deeper. Let me go. It's, it's this, you know, kind of a lazy human nature. Just if it's put on a silver pallet for us, we believe it rather than digging down and, and doing the work ourselves. And I always encourage people do independent research, find your own belief, use the others as a resource. I'm not saying they're bad. They're, they're oftentimes quite good, but keep learning yourself. Don't just trust other people. Bandwagon effect. I say the crop number is this. Ooh, my peer says the crop number is that. Now the third person who had a different number feels kind of silly. I don't want to say that my crop number is significantly higher or lower. So I'm going to lower it to be closer to the average of the market. It's bandwagon, where the more people that believe it, the more people believe it must be true. And oftentimes, when you really want to make money in coffee, you have to have the contrarian view. It can't be the view that, that the whole market has. And then the last one is number basing. What's your estimate of the market for the next couple months? You know, I get it all the time. If the market today is at 190, I'm going to say, I don't know, probably 170, 210. If the market's at 150, I'll go, oh, maybe 130, 170. You know, whatever the recent price history is tends to lead people's belief that it's always going to be like that. There's not many people who are going to tell you, I think the next three months, the market's going to be between 193 and 230. You know, when the market's sitting at 194, you know, people use that number basing and we all kind of just padded and, and those are errors. So those are five things that you can oftentimes see when you're reading research pieces or hearing people talk. And, you know, I don't say you have to challenge them, but just keep in your back of the mind whenever you see this faulty logic being used, even if I might be using it today. So uh, last thing that, that I want to talk about is uh, research for good. So here's a quote. There will be failure of crops in Brazil. The price will run way up. They'll have a big crop and it goes down. The fact is, since I've been in business here, there appears to be no help for it. Coffee is the most speculative business in the world. Would you agree with that statement? I bet you, most of you would probably say, yeah, that, that sounds like what we're living today. But guess what? That's from 1897 by John Arbuckle, testifying in a US antitrust case. As much as we want to believe that we're living something unique, this has been happening since the 1800s. And you can see that when we talk about a market over $2, it's only happened five times since the 1990s. So we are living something unique, but you can see that all these markets, and I'm not saying the market's going down, I'm not saying the market's going up. I already showed you the dry forecast. I already told you, you know, things can go either way, but at some point the market will go down. I mean, that's, that's just reality. These boom and bust cycles are a big problem. And for us as traders who can hedge, for roasters who can raise prices, you know, we can kind of get by. But oftentimes, producers are the ones who end up suffering. And why do they suffer? The price goes high and a farmer plants coffee. There's still a shortage. The price stays high. The second year, they plant coffee. The price stays high. The third year, they plant coffee. And then what they don't know is that if they had just planted one year's worth of coffee, they would have brought the coffee market back into balance. But because they planted the second and the third year, when those crops come into production, we then go into oversupply. And when we go into oversupply, look at all the prior examples. What happens to the price? It goes back down. And this is the volatility that is causing the boom and bust cycle. So what do I think we as an industry need to be doing? And as the next leaders of our industry, I am making this appeal to you. I think we need to be more open with our research. And I think our research shouldn't just be given to traders and also to roasters. We need to include farmers and cooperatives. We need to show them the truth. We, we, we can't give them the raw, raw speech. Everything's gonna be great. You're gonna make more money. Let's go produce more coffee. We need to be honest with them and say, listen, yes, there is this short-term uh, problem, but you know, production is going to come back in Brazil. Prices probably aren't going to stay up high for all the time. So I think there needs to be an education campaign that goes into it. And we also need to think about when the price is high and the farmers actually have margin, should we be encouraging them to plant more? At the same time, we, we've had a lot of discussions around regenerative agriculture. We've had a lot of uh, conversations around carbon credit creation. And I know that, that many of you are working on these topics. When we look at those farms, remember that video that I showed you, the high risk area, should the farmer be replanting coffee there? Or is there a way that we as an industry could be helping them to do something that would be regenerative or could be creating carbon credits instead that might provide some diversification? Or maybe it's a different crop that's not even coffee. 
when has the coffee industry supported farmers to grow something that wasn't coffee that gives them diversification of income that gives them you know a, a more balanced uh, plot of land so for me when i think about research i don't think it's just about let's trade some derivatives or let's have a view on brazil differentials and let's help uh, our clients so that we gain more business i think there needs to be maybe a bit more of an altruistic uh, goal and I would encourage each of you and your companies to really make an effort to reach out to the producing side and the cooperative side to share the information freely so that we have informed and, and educated uh, producers who can make smart decisions. Uh, so with, uh, with that, I will go ahead and let you know. Uh, maybe you were unaware of it. If you're unaware of it, it means I'm really old. Uh, but each of the slides had a had a title track. Uh, they are songs indeed, and there is a playlist uh, to accompany it. Frustratingly enough, uh, it doesn't come in the right order. And in my phone, it looks like it's in the right order, but the playlist, when you pull it up, it, it's slightly out of order. But all the songs are there, and if nothing else, hopefully you'll find some new dis some new musical discoveries if uh, you've at least not learned anything from this. So you can salvage something from your hour. So with that, I will go ahead and stop and would be happy to uh, take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Do, do you mean you selected one song per slide depending on the content? <laughs> if you saw the content headlines of each slide, you would know they were each song titles. Um, yeah. that, that did take me about an hour yesterday, I'm not going to lie. And uh, if I'd had more time, maybe the playlist would be even better. But uh, you know, hopefully there is a theme there. That's good. So happy to share the presentation to everybody on the line. That's going to be great to, to learn from, from, from that side. Um, you mentioned about the numbers in Brazil, and we would like to know what would be your latest expectation about the demand over there. Do you see it growing? Do you see it above 20 million or what's happening? Yeah, I mean, traditionally for me, demand in Brazil, depending upon who you talk to, is in between 20 and 22 million bags. I think that that tends to be kind of the, the general industry accepted average. I would say that the price of coffee has been going up uh, locally and demand in the general feedback that I got. Again, this is that I'm going to make a logical error that I warned you guys not to trust anybody who does this. But mm -hmm. in the people that I talked to, there seemed to be a belief that maybe there would be some slip in demand. Uh, this year due, due to COVID, but also more importantly, due to the local price going up. So if you think about prices in reais per bag, you know, a year or two ago, it was 400 reais a bag. The Arabicas are now at 1,100. The Robusta, the Conawan are at 700. So, and maybe 750. So the price that local roasters are having to pay in local currency has gone up significantly. Now they haven't raised the shelf price accordingly, but the price is still up 20, 30%. And there's a feeling that that might have some, some dent on, on demand figures there. And if they were not 100% robusta, they might become 100% robusta. I would believe that uh, it's impossible to be 100% robusta, but I would believe that there's a higher incorporation of robusta this year than there was last year, yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dave. Another question would be about, we talked about origin, concentration, Brazil, Vietnam, and what's happening this year should be maybe a wake up call saying, hey, be careful, because if something happens to one of these two, we might be in a bigger trouble than we, than we think. So do you expect the, I mean, the people on the line, it's also a question for everybody on the line, uh, can we expect from everybody else to support maybe better other origins? to produce more, to, 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 to make sure that we don't continue to concentrate too much on these two? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's something that we as the trade have been talking about for years. Um, I would say my, my good friend, Trishel at Bull Cafe has been the champion of origin diversification on many of the SCTA panels. Uh, that, that have happened over the last years. And I fully agree, you know, we need to be supporting these origins. We can't be beholden to just two countries, three countries. And the more diversification we build, the stronger and more resilient our coffee supply chains are going to be. So I really hope this is a wake up call and people don't just look for the cheapest diff. They, they are willing to make a, a slight investment to, to be able to continue to support some of these countries. Yes, yes, exactly. And we, you know, we focused this year during the SCT virtual event about uh, education, how education uh, will help the coffee suppliers and the roasters and the farmers at origin to, 
to stay in the coffee business and to continue producing coffee. So that's the theme of the year. And we hope we can bring more information about that to, to everybody. So, so please join us also on, the, on that topic during the SCTA virtual event. Um, it's, it's 11.30. If anyone has any question, please, please raise your hand. Otherwise, you can always continue the discussion via the LinkedIn account. We have um, the, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. We're going to make you, we're going to inform you as soon as it is. But I would like to thank you in, in, in the name of everybody on the line, but also the SCT and Gen Council for, for this very interesting presentation and very, I mean, very, very um, trustworthy because you just went to Brazil and because you presented something a bit different to warn everybody on the line that uh, all information is to take with a, with a bit of salt, maybe sometime. No, really my pleasure. And if anybody wants to reach out, um, I probably should have put it on a slide, but my email's not too complicated, db at sukafina.com. So if anybody wants to reach out directly, always welcome. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. We're 90 people today. Um, anything you want to follow up, we're pleasure we're going to be here. But thank you, Dave. Everybody, good luck in your activities and we're looking forward to seeing you soon. Hopefully in Geneva for the ones who can come in, in a few weeks, but otherwise clearly on the next webinar of the next gen. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, Dave. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.